Thank you, Alan Dale. That was wonderful. Let's give him another hand. <laughs> Always a treat to have our homegrown talent here on stage. Uh, well, welcome everybody. My name is Reverend Alice Reed. I'm the spiritual director here, and I'm so happy that you can be with us for our homecoming Sunday. We have so much uh, to celebrate uh, right now. And if you've been, oh, I left my thing down there, but it's okay. If you've been um, following along in the weekly calendar that CSL has, it's, it's thank you, I was just going to use it for demonstration. This, we have this wonderful weekly calendar that comes out from CSL every year. Um, it goes along with the monthly themes that CSLs all over the country and the world actually are following. And the theme for this month, <laughs> the theme for this month is the mundane, the sacred, and the profane. Oh, my. <laughs> and then we have a couple of things happening this month. So I think we have to zhuzh the theme a little bit. Um, because we have our wonderful homecoming where we've invited you to, to come and celebrate. We have some old friends who have, haven't been here for a while, who I'm so happy to see here in the audience. Uh, it's wonderful to have this time every year where we can celebrate ourselves as a community. The, um, the other thing that's happening this month, and whew, I'm going to take a deep breath. The other thing that's happening this month is that our beloved Diane King Van is retiring. I know that many of you heard that news through the email that went out, but I also know we don't all read our emails, so this may be the first time you're hearing this. I encourage you to read the email because it gives you lots of information about Diane and her decision that she's made to, uh, if I can quote her accurately, to live out loud herself. And... Um, and so we're going to celebrate her on November 19th. And it'll be a wonderful day. And it won't be, well, you may feel profane to you. <laughs> <laughs> Which I imagine it, it does. It'll, it'll be a, a time for us to really celebrate the, the legacy that um, Diane leaves behind after 12 years of being our music director. So we're going to do it right. And as we, we, the other thing that we're looking at is our, our, our legacy members. And so um, I want to invite those of you who have been an active and engaged member for 25 years or more to please stand. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> stay standing. Stay standing. Look around the room. Look around the room. These are the shoulders that you are standing on. And so we want to rub our hands together like the teens used to do. And we want to say, and then put our hands out, and we want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the foundation that you have set. Thank you for the foundation that we're building on. Thank you for all that you have given, being a consistent and dedicated member of our community. You can be seated now. <laughs> our um, wonderful Karen Meyer, who's our resident aid, um, artist, who's also uh, running, the, running the media today, I want to thank her because she created this. You can't see it very well, but I'm going to encourage you to come up and see it after service. She created this beautiful art acknowledgement piece, and it reads... Legacy is not what I did for myself. It's what I'm doing for the next generation. And it goes on to say, thank you for being part of our legacy that not only defines us, but also deepens our sense of belonging. And so there's a list of our members that have been uh, members here for 25 years or more. And I, I have one little thing to say about the list. And that is that we've done an amazing job of keeping track of names and addresses, but not necessarily when you join. So if for some reason you don't find yourself on here, please let us know and we'll go ahead and add you to that acknowledgement. We'll, I'll personally thank you for being a legacy member. And if you are coming up to 25 years, let, 
Reverend Karen or myself or Mary know so that we can add you to the list, so that we can keep track of you because you really are such an important part of the foundation of who we are as a community. You continue to hold the love. I was talking to somebody before the service and I can't remember exactly who, but we were talking about this constant stream of love that has moved through our community. There have been changes. People have come, people have gone, people have retired, people have passed on. But through all the ups and downs, there is this solid core of commitment to one another. And so today, that's what we're celebrating. So whether you're visiting again and you haven't been here for a while, and you've, maybe you've been one of our legacy makers, that's another art piece I'll ask Karen to help me with. <laughs> or maybe you're one of our legacy members, or maybe this is your first time here. I want you to know that you belong, that there is a place for each one of us in this beautiful community we call Centers for Spiritual Living Capistrano Valley. And when I think about the um, 25 years, right? That's over 1,300 Sundays at minimum. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's quite a commitment. And what I know about this community is that we really are dedicated to each other, that there's something here that keeps us coming back, that there's, there's that draw of that uh, center of, of who we are and what we have to offer. And as we look at this idea of the sacred in every day, which is what I renamed this week's talk from the mundane sigh. <laughs> I thought, I thought uh, living, um, you know, being present with the sacred in the everyday really ha ha was a much more inviting pro proposition, don't you think? And as I think about that, I'm reminded of Brother Lawrence. Now, some of you have been here for a while probably have heard of Brother Lawrence, but if you haven't, he is a 17th century, um, he was a lay brother, he wasn't actually a monk, but he was one of those individuals who in the Carmelite order would um, work within the monastery to take care of the day to day. And he's really famous for writing this book called The Practice of the Presence of God. And his practice was that no matter what he was doing, he would have this continual conversation with the divine. He would invite the divine, whether he was preparing food or washing the dishes, whatever he was doing during the day, he found an opportunity to see the sacred in it. He um, approached spirituality that's where he emphasized this idea that there wasn't anything that he was doing that didn't have that fingerprint, if you will, although I don't see God as have being anthropomorphic, anthropomorphic with fingers and a fingerprint, but he would, see, he would see the mark of the divine in everything he did, and he would, he would cultivate that. And he found a, a profound sense of peace and communion when he would cultivate that sense of the divine in everything he did. I, 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 was, I was vacuuming yesterday. <laughs> I did not have a sense of the divine. Uh, <laughs> and when I'm like, you know, trying to get, you know, something really straightened out, or whatever it is um, in my life, uh, it's really easy to get sort of lost in the task and forget that there's something something within the very fiber of whatever I have my hands on, that I too am within the very DNA and the cellular structure of my being, that there within all matter is this beautiful weaving of the divine. Ernest Holmes quotes Jesus in his book, Ideas of Power, where he says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And he goes on to say that what Jesus meant was that we experience God, the presence of God, and we see God right here and right now in the everyday. And when I think about this idea of being blessed or the pure in heart, I think we um, purify our heart. And I don't mean that in a moralistic way. 
but that we purify our heart when we begin to allow our awareness to raise to a point where we can find the divine in whatever we're doing or whatever's in front of us. And it's tempting to get caught up in the spin and thinking that in order to be spiritual, we must be doing something specifically spiritual, right? We must be doing some big uh, impact activity that's going to help us to have the experience of the divine. Or maybe it's just the, the spiritual practice that you do is the place where we can think we're only going to experience the divine. But it's everywhere. It's, you know, the, the kids like to say, uh, it's, uh, there's no place where God is not. And then my dear friend, uh, Don Gilson, would like to say that um, it's either all God or it's not. Right? And so we have this experience. And, and whatever relationship you have to God, I like to think of God as the thing that makes the grass grow. And if I think about it that way, if I think about God as this thing that makes the grass grow, this energy that is underlying all life, well, how can it not be in my very breath and my heartbeat and your heartbeat, in our conversation, in our discussions, in our debates, in our disagreements? I'm remembering Jack Cornfield's famous book, After the Ecstasy, the Laundry. Anybody remember that one, right? Yeah, it's an oldie but goodie. But it, boy, the title said everything. <laughs> You're like, you know, even when we have this experience of ecstatic bliss of oneness and un unitedness with, with whatever, you know, it's, it's this thing that makes the grass grow, when we have that experience, we're still going to be doing the laundry. We're still going to be, going, you know, gassing up our car. We're still going to be taking out the garbage my least favorite chore at home. And so I want to say, you know, what's your least favorite chore? Can you, this week, choose that when you're doing your least favorite chore to make a, a mental note and a conscious intention to see it as a divine act in some way? Right? And I imagine what the world would be like if we could all begin to see the divine in everything. I'm teaching a class on Wednesday mornings. We're almost done. It's been a, it's been a divine experience. And we've, uh, it was, it's called Exploring Roots. And we've looked at Emerson's writings and, and compared them to Holmes. We've looked at Judge Thomas Troward's read, writings. And now we're looking at Emma Curtis Hopkins. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Emma Curtis Hopkins, she is the um, considered the teacher of teachers. She taught Ernest Holmes. She taught Charles and Myrtle Fillmore. So she's, she has imbued her consciousness on a lot of what you experience as being part of this community. And one of the cool things about Emma is that she encourages the spiritual student to look at the places where we have judgments and predestinations a prejudices, a bias that we might have, where we are sorting things as different and apart from us. She uses this term called othering. We might, and, and we can do that in really um, uh, ways in places where we might be experiencing conflict, and we can do it in the, in the mundane and just, you know, writing somebody off or not paying attention to uh, that homeless guy as you walk into the grocery store. And so Emma has this, she goes so far as to say that when we look at life and we don't see the divine in whatever we see, then what we are seeing is just an illusion. It's not real until we see the divine that is Im imbued upon it. That it, once we can open our eyes and begin to see that, that life force that is inherent in you and me and our families and our communities and the people that we hold in high um, uh, uh, admiration and the people we may not hold as high, as in high admiration, that God is in all of that. There are no exceptions, not one, not 
one single exception to that idea. And so start with something easy like doing the dishes and work your way up. But the fact is, if we're walking through life and we're, if we're seeing things that, that we don't attribute to God, then there's something that else we need to see. There's some uncovering. There's some transparency. There's some uh, peace that wants to be revealed to us. And, I, and, and those of you who know me for the last two years, when I share something like this, where I'm talking about seeing God in everything, I'm not talking about doing a spiritual bypass and pretending you haven't been injured or harmed or are having difficulty with somebody. I'm not talking about that at all. I'm asking you to do that deep inner reflection to see where you may have misplaced the divine in the situation. Where is it that you need to see the divine? Is it, is it simply that you need to recognize that the challenge that you're having before you is simply there to help rub off the, the rough edges so that you can be a clearer channel for peace? Maybe the the things that disappoint you are there to help you appreciate the things that and the blessings that are already happening in your life. So we don't pretend that the unlovely things in life aren't happening, but we do spend enough time, and this, for me, this is pure Emma, we spend enough time looking at the condition to see where we have a false belief so that we can get clear about our relationship with the divine and our relationship with life. And when the clarity comes, inevitably, the difficulty gets easier. The, the pathway is made clear. And we can move forward, supported by that thing that makes the grass grow that wants to support you in everything that you do. Emma had a, a, a mantra that I'm using a lot right now. <laughs> and it simply goes like this. This too is good, this too is God, and I demand to see the blessing in it. Amen. <laughs> this too is good, this too is God, and I demand to see the blessing in it. And there, now, you know, when we have those heartbreaks, those things that are really difficult, it's sometimes hard to see the blessing in it. But what she's encouraging us to do is to, to raise, you know, and this is, again, Emma-type uh, languaging, she to raise our spiritual eyes so that we can get in touch with what is in this for us. What is it that, you know, either is um, compelling us to move in a different direction or maybe it's compelling us to, to get stand in our truth. There's always some growth in it. I want you to think about the last time you had a growth spurt, some kind of spiritual growth that happened in your life, and, and see if you can remember some of the circumstances that might have been happening in your life at that time. There's probably a little bit of dust getting kicked up in your world in one way or another. Because oftentimes, it is that movement of our, that helps to shift our thinking and shift our perception and raise our awareness to what it is that uh, the divine wants us to experience and what it is we want to engage in. And so when you find yourself either in a place of conflict or maybe it's a place of apathy where you're just not, not feeling like there's anything that is moving you from, from your heart space, or maybe you're not feeling engaged. The question to ask yourself is, and to be curious about it, is what is it that, that I'm missing? Where am I not seeing God? Where am I not seeing love? Where is there a greater opportunity for me to love? One of my um, favorite practices is something called the love prayer. And, and 
I'll say that the, the love prayer, when I learned it, it reminded me of, of Brother Lawrence finding the divine in something and being settling myself. It reminded me of Emmett Fox's uh, golden key. Are you familiar with Emmett Fox's golden key? It's when, we're, when we are in any kind of a turmoil, we are to think of God. And so this love prayer is a, is a practice of getting still and neutralizing our emotions so that we can be present with whatever's going on. It's, it's both Brother Lawrence, Emmett Fox, this love prayer practice, all of it is really this meaningful, mindful practice because uh, I don't know about you, but when the ground beneath me begins to shift a little, <laughs> You know, I'm thinking about survival. I'm thinking about security. I'm thinking about trying to be safe. I'm not really thinking straight. So the love prayer is simply a practice of whatever is disturbing you, that you simply close your eyes and go within, answer your phone, turn it off, tell them you're about to pray. And um, bring the place of disturbance that is coming up for you and, and repeat in your mind, I accept this or I accept you with the inhalation and with each exhalation, I bless you or I bless this. And it might be difficult. It might be really difficult to get that first sentence out, I accept you. But I guarantee you, this is not about acquiescing to, to, to harm or things that are, that are challenging to you. It is about getting ourselves centered so then we can truly be a channel for peace and communion with the divine and seeing the divine in the mundane and the unlovely as well as the bliss. Would you like to try the practice right now, shall we? Yeah, so, so close your eyes and, and bring forward something that you're feeling a little challenged by. Ooh, take a deep cleansing breath. And know what that thing, whether it's a circumstance or an individual, and have that name in front of you. And then with each inhalation, I want you to say, I accept this or I accept you and name it. And then with the exhalation, I bless you, or I bless this and name it. And continue to do that with the natural cycle of your inhalation and exhalation. I accept you. I bless you. I accept you. I bless you. And when you're ready, complete the last cycle and come back into this space. a little different? Yeah. Yeah. It centers us. It gets us in the now moment. Eckhart Tolle, famous for the power of now, the power of being present in this now moment. Because when we are all wrapped up in the past or we're all wrapped up in the future, we're not in this now moment. I had a dear friend on the East Coast. His name was Ruby. And Ruby used to say, that the smallest package in the world was a person all wrapped up in themselves. <laughs> and what he's really talking about is getting to that place of this now moment so that we can get some perspective, so that we can begin to look at what it is that's in front of us and allow the divine to open our spiritual eyes to what it is that we need to see or do. And, or maybe it's just to be with. 
What I know about the divine is that when we become conscious and intentional, the way is made known, the path becomes clear, and we are led with grace, with ease, and with power. Thank you very much. So let's do a little spiritual practice, shall we? And you can close your eyes or lower your gaze as I, or you can keep your eyes open and see the beauty around you. For what I know is it's all God. It's all grace. It's all love. And there is a power in it that when I recognize this basic truth of life, that I too experience the grace and the power and the love that I attribute to the divine. For there is no place that God ends and I begin. It is just a continuum of energy that is moving and reproducing itself over and over again in my mind, in my thoughts, in my feelings, in my actions, in the things that I see. So we just breathe in and allow ourselves to trust and to have faith that we will be guided that we will know what our part is to do or just to be as we allow the grace of God to move through us. And so I know as we move through this week, as we move through the rest of our afternoon, uh, morning, and, and uh, into lunchtime and this celebration of this center and all the, the lives that it has touched in the 55 years that it has been around, hmm. I know that w this is our inheritance and we will continue to build on that legacy as we move forward, being in spiritual community, being that center drop that ripples outward. And so I trust that each one will see spirit in the plainest of things as well as in the majesty of life for it is ours to see, it is ours to notice, it is ours to be grateful for. And it is with an uh, open heart and a grateful mind that I simply anchor this prayer in the power and the presence of the one as we say together, and so it is. Thank you very much. And now